starts recording as well. Yeah? So um, good uh, afternoon, evening, everyone. Um, welcome back again to the um, Lincolnshire Grand Rounds. And as usual, we have an uh, like an exciting uh, topics um, for the um, people who are interested in ENT training and also the well-established uh, consultants or um, new consultants as well, uh, especially um, in different topics. The topics today, I uh, think that everyone is also would like to know more about it, uh, which is the uh, robotic uh, uh, surgery in ENT and head and neck. Uh, so we have our uh, special guest. I don't want to say guest because Bindi now become part of the Lincolnshire, despite he's in Derby. Uh, so we have uh, with us uh, uh, the Professor uh, Bindi Sahota. He's a consultant head and neck surgeon in Derby, associated uh, uh, honorary associated consultant in uh, Nottingham, and also uh, senior associated lecturer in Derby Shire. Um, and thank you, thanks for the acceptance, uh, uh, Bindi. Oh, always a pleasure, uh, Mr. Ibrahim, and uh, thank you for having me as always. Um, this is kind of an amalgamation of several different talks um, that I've kind of given. Um, so the primary thing about TORS is everybody talks about like TORS is some sort of golden standard. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try and run through lots of different aspects of the TORS. And so what we'll talk about is basically a little quick background of the history of robotics. So you know where it's all come from. Yeah. And then where the access came from in regards to doing this and why other types of minimally invasive surgery were appropriate before TORS even came into the mix. I'll throw a couple of trials which are pro and against TORS and then I'll mention the, the current trials that are out there which are probably going to sway us more and more towards TORS. I'll quickly um, mention a couple of reviews of arterial ligation, one which my unit have done. Um, I'll give you some backgrounds of our TOR setup in our unit and then we'll talk about setting up a TORS program itself, so funding, education, credentialing. Then we'll talk about the actual setup of um, the TORS, as in physically how do you set it up, um, and then we'll talk about some operative videos at the end. I'll talk you through them as we go. So as you're well aware, from a robotics point of view, robot robotics came from the space program. And this is because you have a load of people who are literally off Earth and they need healthcare delivered remotely. So originally it was the process of thinking about what's called telesurgery. Then it developed from that with the armed forces of actually you probably don't want to take doctors out to the front line with them potentially of risking their lives and therefore loads of different companies including Zeus, Da Vinci and Aesops all started pushing on the robotics front as a whole. Now if you think about the actual application of surgery, well I'm a consultant of several years standing already, you know by the time I was a toddler, they'd already started doing the first stereotactic brain biopsy using a robot, which was with a Puma system in 1985. So robotics in surgery isn't new. Yeah, it's fundamentally been there for, in effect, two decades as a minimum. Yeah. And if, if you compare us and look at other um, industries, so for instance, car manufacturer is a big one, you know, that what robotics has done is it streamlined um, and improved the actual access and speed of doing things and it's made the actual processes more efficient and that's where robotics kind of comes in and into its own so if you actually look at the first bit of um, what class is large surgery so you went through 85 with the stereotactic bone biopsy which is basically a ct guided bone biopsy then they did a terp in 88 in 92 they did a hip replacement with a, a specific orthopedic thing the da vinci in 98 did a um cabbage in 1997 it did the first splenectomy then zeus in 2001 did tele robotic surgery so remote surgery and then the acquisition of intuitive basically took over the da vinci system in 2003 and that's really where all this has kind of taken off from primarily with da vinci overall so from a head neck point of view so these are basically uh, professors weinstein and o'malley from u penn in america these are the guys who basically pushed for tours primarily so in france they did the first prostatectomy in 2000 then a couple of um 
surgeons used da Vinci just to take out a molecular cyst to show it was actually possible. Then Weinstein and O'Malley then jumped on animals, and I think it was a porcine model initially. They then showed that you could actually do the resection in pigs. Then they did a series of 20 base of tongue mucosectomies in effect, in effect to show feasibility. And then they lobbied for the FDA approval to have these things. When they lobbied it, they actually had three operations in effect, and they were set operations. One was an oropharyngectomy, the other is a hemiglossectomy, and the other one was a supraglossal laryngectomy. And they were the first three transcribed operations because the FDA approval needs it for it to be like a block unit. And it's classed as natural orifice surgery. Well, we know this, we're ENT surgeons. So why is it so important for us? You know, if you have your prostate removed, you know, for open surgery, there are loads and loads of side effects. And the fact is, you're normally in hospital for a week to two. With open prostates, there's whole heaps of problems with um, other uh, complications that occur in regards to erectile dysfunction, problems with urinary output, and so on and so on. Almost all of these are obliterated with robotic surgery. And actually, in effect, you go home the next day. From a head and neck point of view, well, our big things are how do you access the back of the tongue? How do you access the parapharyngeal space? So we have significant morbidity with any type of jaw split where you have to split and put everything back together. You get problems with their speech, their swallowing, they get risk of their airway, they often have to have tracky, trackies in temporarily, there's a risk of saliva leaking into the neck, fistulas and all the things that you get of the big nasties from a head and neck point of view. Now, if you look at open approaches like this, you know, this is a re-resection of oropharynx that I did many years ago as a registrar with one of the consultants in Nottingham, where in effect the entire jaw has been split and everything's been loped outwards. And you can see here, here the carotid's completely open. You know, the morbidity for this is absolutely humongous. Yeah, the patient's never, their speech is never quite as tangible as it was before. And the why outcomes are always dreadful. This is your robotic approach. So this is a patient from the Royal Adelaide Hospital on the left, and this is their standard setup. So we use nasal intubation as the primary mode, and we then set up to use the robot primarily intraorally as a whole. So why why has robotics just suddenly turned up out of nowhere? Well, it hasn't really. We've been using the principles applied to robotics, but we've been using lots of different methods. So prior to robots kind of being released, and you can see um, with these publications, please note, you know, the primary author who was a fellow at the time with Professor Vin Polari, who was also a fellow at Royal Adelaide Hospital, like myself and many other robotic surgeons in the UK. At that point in time, they were using lasers to uh, um, with a fibre to remove tumours of the upper area digestive tract. and you know, there's lots of use of laparoscopic surgical instruments. And if you look at the group in Reading this last year, they did their first bit of um, uh, transoral thyroid surgery, which was with endoscopes. So the, these things were already there and they're already kind of getting pushed forwards and they're already kind of getting improved overall um, where, where we are. So the work from Steiner et al, and Steiner's group really changed the delineation of um, what would be classed as microsurgery primarily. So when you look at what Steiner did, he has hundreds to thousands of patients where he's had lots of data shown the way in early larynx cancer, early hyperpharynx cancer, early oropharynx cancer, early supraglottic cancer, that actually you can get clear mar margins with the Steiner method. The Steiner method being very different to a classical resection because you transect across the tumour and then bring it out as a partial resection and then do it again. So you transgress into the tumour. But this work here basically has shown for multiple decades that this is amenable, sensible and accessible and acceptable in regards to cancer cure rates. So what's the issues with transoral and I'm saying about laser surgery primarily. So there's lots of issues with ergonomics. You know, there's counterintuitive movement, there's issues with hand-eye alignment and having to work on what's called straight line working. Um, there's issues with instrument tremor or if the microscope shakes, it gives you a 2D view of a 3D structure and you have to work these straight line optics, which are a lot harder than you think they are. And there's issues with alignment of the CO2 beam, you just need the microscope to be slightly off and your angulation is really difficult. 
and there's issues with there being a significant learning curve. Here you can see Professor Krishnan and here's Prof Blary on his fellowship in Royal Adelaide Hospital at that point in time. Yeah. So what are the general principles for assessment of minimally invasive oropharynx surgery? Now, this is something that I will always bring up with my regs. So when we do an EUA of a patient, these are things that we kind of want to look at. So when we EUA a patient and they've got, say, a tonsil tumour, I just don't want a, just a picture and a biopsy. What I want to think about is where is the tumour? What is involved? How big will the resection be? How mobile is it? Is it fixed to the deep muscles laterally? like the styloglossus, the stylopharyngeus, is it through the constrictor? Is it attached to the prevertebral fascia? Can I get a margin around it? Yeah. And mobility is one of the main cruxes of things to think about. So when we select minimally invasive patients, we predominantly choose T1, T2 oropharynxes. We can go for any end status, but generally N0 to N2B, most people being N1 or N2A disease are feasible. I think it always gets a bit tricky when you get to N3 disease, especially with N3 and you've got ECS, um, because you, you know you're going to have dual modality because that kind of goes against a lot of what robotics suggests. So we tend to like things where they're discrete lesions, where you've got loads of field change. Robotics doesn't do that well, because where do you stop your resection? Yeah, if you think of the actual oropharynx and the throat as a whole, you've got the tongue base, you've got your tonsillar space, you've got your posterior pharyngeal wall. Now, I generally think of this, that if you denigrate more than 50% of the whole pharynx, that's when you get significant problems with swallowing as a whole. Yeah, so you can kind of get away with taking away 50, maybe even a little bit more, but anything kind of more than that causes you lots of issues. So you have to put this in, into context. You've got to think about what, why we're doing this for HPV positive disease. We're doing this to reduce the functional impairment overall, and we're hoping to save some patients getting radiotherapy. In HPV negative disease, we're trying to improve the chance of a patient surviving. We know that those diseases with negative disease will do worse. We know their chance of recurrence is higher. Their chance of distal disease is higher. We also know that they're going to have significant complications in regards to morbidity, secondary to surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, but we want these people to live. Yeah. Whereas we want the HPV positive people to live and have high levels of function. And ideally in both world, you know, in, in an ideal world would want both sets to be that, but we've just got to be pragmatic about this. A lot of patients have been treated by radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And this is because, you know, our forefathers and foremothers in the ENT fraternity gave up a lot of our practice away um, to radiotherapy and chemotherapy as they progressed. And once IMRT came, it really, really, really improved things overall. But we are at the stage where we've started clawing them back over the last decade. So, so what are the strategies of TORS or oropharynx uh, work? So you want a lateralizing primary neck disease. Yeah, you want to think about if the neck disease is uh, involving the carotid. You don't want it around more than 270 degrees of the carotid because it isn't going to improve their prognosis. You want to try and minimise their radiation field and potentially avoid chemo. You can sometimes use it to identify the primary and what's called diagnosis of the unknown primary. And you can use it to resect other select tongue-based tumours or oropharynx tumours. It can also be used for benign conditions such as Eagle syndrome, um, as well as access to the peripharyngeal space and things like neuromas and things, which I will show you some videos of later. So I already kind of spoke about um, a little bit of this before. Yeah, um, and I'll kind of run through it as a whole. So when you're thinking about the TORS assessment of patients, you want to go through your history, you want to know the smoking status realistically for risk stratification. People who continue to smoke through surgery and radiotherapy do worse overall. You want to know the element of trismus because what the trismus is like when they start, it's only going to be worse after surgery or radiotherapy as a whole. I normally ask about referred otalgia and I want to check about the fixity of the neck nodes and how they lift off. You want to make sure there's no distant metastasis. You want to see there's no imaging issues on the contralateral tonsils, which does catch some people out occasionally. You want to think about contralateral neck nodes and in particular retropharyngeal nodes, because that's something that's often overlooked in imaging. 
you want to see your nodal involvement size, and obviously you want to get this all discussed through the MDT with your patients. From your imaging point of view in our unit, we tend to use MRI as our primary modality. Some places use CT. MRI just gives you better soft tissue definition, as I'm sure you're well aware. You want to think about the vascularations to the tumour. It's really, 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 really important when you're assessing tonsil tumours to see if the plane between the tonsil tumour and the um, constrictor is intact. Yeah. Once it's gone through the constrictor, you're really going to start to struggle getting a five millimetre margin at that point in time. You also want to look at the styloglossus and the hyoglossus because these two muscles basically separate the tonsil tissue from the deep neck structures. Think about the posterior belly, the digastri, because if you're going to take out a large oropharyngectomy, that's where you're going to get your defects between the inside of the throat and the neck. You want to think about the deep lobe of the submandibular gland. You want to think about the mandible, because obviously if any of these tumours are plastered to the mandible, that upstages them straight to T4 and they're not suitable for robotic surgery. If they've got obvious ECS on imaging, this is one of the things that sometimes um, pushes us away from robotic surgery, because sometimes it's not sensible or pragmatic to actually offer robotic surgery because the patient's going to need dual modality treatment with the radiotherapy as one of the modalities. So ECS, sometimes if it's upstage, then we in our MDT, we do give them away. I know certain units still do robotic surgery, but then I, I find it's a bit of an ethical dilemma of you then subdue that patient to triple modality treatment. So you don't sabotage them once, neither do you sabotage them twice, but you give them three different modalities that all give them different side effects as a whole. And like I said, the other kind of big cohort of um, group of patients to be wary of patients with retropharyngeal node involvement, because these can often catch people out. And these are more problematic where you have tumours within the midline um, because these can go to either side. They don't tend to happen with lateralizing tumours on one side of the neck. And then we're going to talk about the UA pandoscopy in a second. And then obviously the patient needs to be fit from an anaesthetic point of view, nasal tubes ideally, and we've got local guidelines for analgesia. This is an image of Prof. Christian um, just doing an EUA. So classically we go for a um, the four T's, so checking for trismus, the neck tilt, the size of the tongue, and tumour assessment factors. So the trismus breakup is, have they got big teeth that are problematic? How's their occlusion? What's the transverse width of their jaw? If their width of their jaw is very narrow, it can make the assessment really quite poor. Then you want to think about the neck tilt, so you want to be able to tilt their head back as far as they can. You want to make sure that you can get good access to the anterior larynx. And this is exactly what the anaesthetists do. So they check the thorough mental distance and the sterile mental distance, which are all things which look for difficult airways. And the transverse width of the jaw is also one of these things. You want to check back mobility. You want to check flexion because you really want to get these guys um, both flexed in certain places and sometimes very extended. Post radiation, they often have fixed radiation fibrosis and fixed deformities and they struggle to turn their head back. That can actually make robotic surgery more difficult. With the endoscopes that you use, we use a combination of zeros and thirties and thirties help you to see around corners a little bit better than zeros. I tend to do my oropharynx work um, in the tonsil with a zero degree. I tend to do tongue base and lower with a third degree as my general rule of thumb. In regards to the tongue, you want to think about the general size, the view of the four C's, the tonsils, the lingual tonsils, epiglottis, and the larynx pharynx. From a tumour point of view, we've already kind of spoken about this. You want to look at the actual absolute size of it. You want to check the mobility from the neck that it's separate. You want to check the mobility from the raphe and the prevertebral fascia. And you want to make sure that the pterygomandibular raphe isn't involved because that is all the pterygoids because they are both factors that um, will stop resectability of this as a whole. This is just my my exact same chunch cheat sheet that I actually go through with my registrars that I use, and I always find this is a very nice, easy way of kind of thinking about it when you're looking at it from a global assessment point of view. So I'm going to give you a few quick tidbits overall. So these are a few papers. So this is um, a review, which is quite old now. It's almost a decade old, well, it is a decade old, um, of transoral uh, robotic surgery and radiotherapy for early cancers back then. And back then, basically, IMRT for T1s and T2s showed that they had equivocal results even then in regards to local, regional, and um, disease-specific survival and disease-free survival. Distant control is actually better generally with TORs um, than it was with other 
um, treatments such as IMAT and actually the overall survival was the same, which is great work. Then you can't ignore the high levels of, of um, basic evidence for adjuvant radiotherapy. Basically, if you have minimally invasive surgery and you've got clear margins and it's T1, T2 tumour, it's an early end stage, there's no ECS, no uh, adverse features and the margins currently greater than five millimeters then you don't need any adjuvant treatment if you've got a t2 plus or t3 plus or a close margin then you can get adjuvant radiotherapy if you've got involved margins or ecs floridly then you need chemo radiotherapy and th these are kind of um big um, reviews in regards to all of this uh, sorry, one of the other points, um, more than 50% will have some element of e ECS, and this is in the older papers, but I found this has probably decreased down to about a third now. So you can't talk about TORS without mentioning the ORATA trial. So the ORATA trial basically randomised oncology versus surgery, and this was the first trial. I'm not 100% convinced in regards to the way it was designed. The end number is quite small. Basically, the uh, T1 or T2 tumours with early neck disease, and they're randomised to basically radiotherapy plus minus chemo or plus minus neck dissection. The primary outcome was basically just using the MDALI as the swallowing outcome, which is a, and they were looking for a 10 point difference at one month to see if it's significant. If the difference was less than 10 points, then it was not significant. Um, what they basically found was the swallowing outcomes diminished over time. The margins for primary tumours to be classed as negative, they used to use one centimetre mar margins for HP negative disease, but only two millimetres for HP positive disease. This is slightly out of the modality of what's kind of currently expected. Out of these 68 patients, 80% of them were, were P16 disease. The MDADI is a it was originally designed as a swallowing assessment tool for people undergoing laryngectomy. So it's actually not specific enough to be designed for this. Maybe they should have considered using fees. The follow-up was kind of three to five years, which may not show long-term toxicity of, you know, chemo therapy, which can happen in a decade or even two decades later. So that's my kind of comments about Orator 1, and then I can't um, dodge Orator 2, which I'm sure you're all very much aware of. With Orator 2, um, they terminated this early because they had a couple of deaths in this. So they basically um, randomised these as well for either radiotherapy and chemotherapy or towards the neck dissection. So in Orator 2, they basically pushed for trachea for lots of surgical patients, so therefore they got increased morbidity as a consequence of that. They had some is issues about recruitment and there were some concerns about not selecting the right people. The complications they had, one was a bleed, which, you know, is the big risk for robotic surgery and the other was skull based osteomyelitis which to me suggests they've probably dissected a lot of the preverbal fascia um and again this isn't necessarily the only reason to kind of terminate against robotic surgery if you look at e3311 so this was uh, published about 18 months ago and this day is very pro tours um where you had a randomized phase two study with TORS plus radiotherapy plus minus chemo for stage three or four advanced HPV positive disease. They must have been suitable for TORS and then they were group dependent on their margin. So they were all going to have surgery anyway. Group A must have had a clear margin. If you go into group B, you must have a close margin on multiple nodes which upstage you. And then you're randomized into a low um, dose radiotherapy at 50 grays or a high dose radiotherapy at 60 grays. And arm D was where you had a positive margin or ECS or five plus nodes. And this is where you got chemo radiotherapy as a whole. And this is very similar to pathos in regards to it. And we'll come back to that in a minute um, because that's going to be a, a couple of slides again. So they had 519 patients. The pathology uh, determined which group arm they were going to go into. So most arms, so if you actually look at this, only 11% of all of their patients actually had clear margins of, you know, significantly um, of greater than three millimetres. So that's where they've used it. So it's pretty hard to get the classical one centimetre margin because there really isn't space, as you'll see in a minute. Most people, so the other 60% of people ended up in arms B and C, and they are basically split. And... Um, there's kind of a very even split between BC and D with the rest of the cohort. The provisional data was followed up for three years, and there's going to be a later data set on this. 
there basically was no difference whether you got low dose radiotherapy as your adjuvant treatment or high dose radiotherapy as a whole. Um, and um, they're, they're basically the things to look at. And there was no difference for the ones with ECS between um, Bs and Ds or Cs and Ds as a whole. Generally, smokers did worse overalls and arms, Bs, B or C overall, um, which is very interesting to look at. These are the Kaplan-Meier curves. Just rattle through this. So the swallowing outcomes with E3311 showed that the actual long-term swallowing outcomes for people with the MDADI was actually very, very good. The E3311 demonstrated high oncological efficiency in large multicenter trial, and it actually showed with 50 grades of less than one millimeter, um, uh, extra extension would provide 70% of patients de-intensified de -intensified treatment. There's going to be long-term follow-up, and they are also combining with this trial, which you should be aware of, which is PATHOS, which is basically is the same sort of trial where people are having their minimally invasive surgery, whether that's with a laser, a robot, or an endoscope. If they have um, no adverse features, they've got clear margins, then they don't get any treatment, and they're falling arm a group A. If they're intermediate, then they get randomized basically into the low and the high group and group C get randomized into uh, post-operative radiotherapy or chemotherapy as a whole. E3311 and this are actually joining forces and there will be a combined data set for both of these. So I think when this comes out, it'll completely change where we stand in regards to trials in regards to this. Uh, the recut data I'm just going to very quickly mention on which is for people who have recurrent disease as a whole, the long and the short of this is if you've got recurrent disease after you've had some sort of primary treatment, whether that's surgery, radiotherapy or whatever, then you've got a very, very high rate of bleed rate and return to theatre and a high rate of trachea or feeding tube dependency as a consequence of all these interventions. In the only kind of slide I'm going to put about arterial ligation, once TORS has come out into the mainframe subsequently from 2007, it's brought a whole heap of uh, new complications, which weren't really seen that much by ENT surgeons. I know we see a lot of post tonsil bleeds, but you know a post TORS bleed is potentially potentially life threatening, and I'm aware of at least a few patients who have died as a consequence of these. Now, what's really really interesting is that we've been like eating. Um, carotid artery branches for the best part of a decade and a half now and there are at least two if not three multi um multi-reviewed articles on this which basically show that your risk factors for bleeding are radiotherapy and advanced tumors and actually ligating your um branches of carotid artery um work really well to decrease the intensity and severity of bleeding. So it doesn't change the rate of bleeding, but your life-threatening bleeds basically get nipped in the bud. Yeah. And that's that's what's really important to know about this. So just a quick bit about us, and I'm going to flip through a few of these slides. So UHTB, we're a bit of a, a large unit. So we're the third largest elective hospital in the entire UK. We're the eighth largest hospital in regards to bed numbers and we're the eighth busiest admission rate for this tiny little place in the um, Midlands. But we just have a large workload. So back to 2009, at that point in time, there were only 11 DaVinci platforms. And this is where everything started with UHDB. Most of these were in London. They're predominantly there for MDT programs, cross specialty to deliver services. At that point in time, you know, it cost 1.3 million to buy a robot. Now they go for about 1.5 and people didn't have tariffs for any of this surgery as a whole. So we looked at setting up the robotic program at that point in time and there are additional costs with the 1.3 million to get you started. You need to think about consumables, which are in the region of 150,000 a year. What was the training? Because there was no established training at that point in time. What are the costs associated with learning? What are the ongoing costs of offering surgery? It's all about money, money, money. So UHDB, we're really lucky. We are the Candy Crush Hospital. In effect, we had Mel Morris, who's a local entrepreneur and businessman. He uh, ran a lot of dating sites, then he sold those, and then he made this thing that most of you probably heard of called Candy Crush, and he's the Candy Crush billionaire. Um, 
and he had a chance meeting with one of our consultant urologists, who's Stephen Thomas in the bottom right corner. They ended up uh, arranging and he paid for the platform um, and the initial training and the consumables for the first three years and um, then allowed us to help us set up the programme. In most hospitals in the UK, this is how, especially early adopters, this is how most people have set those up by getting a, a charitable entrepreneur to help. So initially, the four specialities that started were urology, colorectal, head, neck, and gynae. And in 2014, which was 10 years ago, which is when we started our program, um, so we, we we set this all up from 2009, and it took five years to get it off the ground. Um, but we were the four specialities that were involved um, at that point in time. And like I say, we're now into our first 10 years of doing robotics. So. We use the DaVinci training platform, wet labs, mentorship, solo cases, revisits for a mentor with review. For every surgeon that you train, it costs about £20,000 per surgeon to actually train them to do this. Here's my credentialing personally, and you can see my letters of sign off from the Intuitive and from the Royal Adelaide Hospital for my sign off for this. And so we, we in effect, to get this done for everybody there. And so what did we initially start with? So we rolled it out in urology and we want to do a bit of progressive rollout. So initially we increased the robotics cases from prostate surgery. So in the first year we did 30% um, robotics, 70% open. The second year we did 50-50. And the third year we're doing predominantly robotics. We don't do open prostate surgery realistically in our unit anymore. Um, so urology did the first four months, then head and neck, then colorectal, then gynae. So we rigorously audited all our data. We've um, had done so well with robotic numbers that um, we actually got a second unit and that arrived in February 2020. And we're actually at the stage where we're looking at getting a third robot because um, as you'll see in a second, our time times are pretty full. This is our main site robot. So if you look at yellow, yellow will be the color to remember because it's head and neck. Um, you know, we have every single week a robot theater for three sessions alternating between Wednesdays and Mondays, depending on the week of the uh, month it is. Um, and this is the robot theater where you have two head and neck surgeons. I go to every single robot list. Two of my colleagues go to alternate weeks on each side, and that's included with our fellow and our uh, registrars as well come across because obviously you get lots of neck dissections from these. This is the day case suite. And the reason that it's color coordinated, as you'll see, you can see the overall trend here and you can notice obviously there's a big dip here. Something happened in the world. I think it was called COVID where there's a drop, but our robotics program is just going up and 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 it's just dragging upwards in regards to what we're doing. And obviously there was a big jump because we got a new robot here. So everything kind of picked up a little bit. And this is what our activity is looking at um, overall when you're looking at this. And it's really, really picking up overall in our numbers. And these are our absolute numbers. But we do around about 60 to 80 head and neck robotics procedures a year at Derby. So what are the fundamental issues? So when you're setting up a new program, you need to think about how do you go around visiting other centres to learn tricks of the trade? How do you get a structured training? What do you do with an equity of approach? How do you get appropriate certification? How do you get mentorship with recognized trainers? Now that does exist. When we started, that didn't exist very well. You need to think about leadership from a um, managerial point of view and clinical point of view and having the foresight of thinking of what you need now to what you're going to need in the future. Because it, you know, a robot's not just a toy that you can just go play with. You need to have lots of structure and support for it. You need to have a really clear governance process, which is open. You have to have a sound, safe program and stick to it. And you need to think about general collaborative working. So what are the pitfalls? These are kind of the opposites of everything I've just said. So I mean, non-certified trainers, you know, it is very difficult sometimes when you're tr trying to set up a unit that you can't train everybody at the same time. So you do have to tell some people you do need to wait. It's not gatekeeping. It's just looking at it pragmatically and functionally that you can't deliver everything all at once to the same person and you can't over dilute the practice as well. Yeah, because you need significant numbers. Um, otherwise, you're going to get problems with market saturation. You need to make sure that you're appropriately um, auditing the data and not fudging it, getting issues with access because everybody wants access once you've got a robot. Timetabling, referrals to other centres, cleaning, continued costs. Remember, it, it's simply a instrument. It's a knife, a fork, a spoon. Yeah. 
just if I gave you a bowl of peas, you could eat a bowl of peas with a knife, but it would probably be easier to eat with a fork and probably even easier eating it with a spoon. And that's what the robot is. It's simply a tool in your armamentarium allowing you to deliver certain sorts of services. So where are the sites in Head and Neck for access for tours? So I was just trying to go from the top down, which is to try and make it easier. So you can take out palatal tumors, but you can do that with a headlight. You can take out oropharynx tumors, but again, you can do that with a laser or an endoscope. Superglossic tumors is where it really comes into its own when you're getting right around that corner and access to the hyperpharynx. You can take out tumors of the posterior pharyngeal wall. You can get access to the parapharyngeal space. You can look at that's attacking things like Eagle syndrome from the inside. There are now people pushing this towards laryngeal application and uh, you can insert flaps with this, but it's often, I, I generally find anybody who's done this uh, often finds it quite laborious and quite painful in the grand scheme of things. So just, I don't want to go too much into the anatomy um, of this as a whole, because there's whole um, um, videos by Ajith George, who gives amazing talks of the anatomy of the constrictors uh, as a whole. When you're looking at um, basically a throat, this is your normal setup when you're looking at it with a patient supine, head open, the base of the tongue going to a superior aspect of the screen, the cranially going inferiorly. But when you think about it as ENT surgeons, you're all aware of the tonsils, but you've got to think of what's on the other side of the tonsil, which is muscle number three, which is superior constrictor. You then get two other additional um, kind of uh, muscle think about. So you need to think about the anterior tonsil pillar, i.e. your platoglossus muscle, and then your posterior, your platopharyngeus muscle. Underneath the constrictor, you then need to think about the two other sets of muscles. So both the styloglossus and the stylopharyngeus. Stylopharyngeus being this broad kind of band-shaped muscle is often a, a little bit thinner than it should be, and the styloglossus more like a singular band going straight down to the tongue. Now, these are really, really important landmarks to look at from a head and neck anatomy point of view, and they'll come up on this picture in a second. So when you're looking at the top, you've got the median raphi of where the uh, mast masticator is, and the pterygomandibular raphi and the buccinator, which comes forward. You've got your superior constrictor, then you've got your platoglossus muscles, like we said about, so your anterior pillar, your platopharyngeus muscle, i.e. your posterior pillar. Then you've got to think deeper down, you've got your medial pterygoids, and you've got your styloglossus muscle. Now, the f the obvious thing when you get down there is the way you tell the difference between the pterygoids and the styloglossus is how the fibres move. So your pterygoids are at right angles, whereas your styloglossus is in the orientation of the pa patient. And this is just an axial view of this. So this is your robot setup. So on the left of the image, you've got um, the actual Da Vinci robot itself. You've got in the middle the cart, which is where all the gizmo gets plugged in. And on the right, you've got the surgeon console as a whole, which is where you actually do the robotics. And the thing about robotics is it's all about wristed elements of surgery as you rotate. It's not like laparoscopic surgery where you're working on a big parallax like this. Yeah. And I'm sure you've all done some endoscopic um, stuff, and I'm sure you know, you've know you done a general surgery rotation and played with a laparoscope. But robotics is all about fine increment movements with turning at the wrist to give you that angle of movement, and it's not big kind of clamming movements across. So from a head and neck point of view, this is our general setup. So we have a GA, we have nasal intubation, we follow our local TORS protocol, we get the robot docked in, and brought in. We use 0 and 30 degree scopes, we use a vascular applicator and we get a tonsil tray. And so this is kind of how we're, we're generally set up. So the anaesthetist um, kit's all kind of down this side. Here you can see the robot overall. This is the surgical assistant down on this side who's the head end surgeon. We then basically have the kind of the bed set up here. So we we dock at a combination, so you can either use 45 degrees or you can use 90 degrees, so we use a bit of both in our unit. We normally have a surgeon at our primary console and then we have a trainee at the secondary console, so we can actually train people as we operate. So the thing that I was talking about a minute ago was what the primary thing is that the instruments are endo-wristed, so they move like a little tiny wrist, yeah? So they're not like a laparoscope where they swing, they have this arc of movement in a very fine area and that's what it's all about that's why the robot is really good at getting around those corners yeah and 
you know, I find this a lot easier than the laser. And it's funny because I'll do tongue based resection with a robot, but I won't do it with a laser because I find it so difficult. And that's just because in my hands, I've done two robotics fellowships. And that's what I've learned over that time in Newcastle in the UK and the Royal Adelaide Hospital as a combination. So we tend to get this 9 TLM micro long recipe set just because it's got a clip applicator and it's got these fine little uh, applicator clips. We also have a pneumatic clip applicator as well, which works really, really very, very well overall um, in regards to getting there. So I'm going to bring you around to a few sets of images. So this, um, so there, I've got quite a lot of videos, but I've only loaded up four or five for you. Um, so I'm going to talk you through a oropharyngectomy. This is a courtesy of Professor Krishnan from Adelaide, who is my mentor, who is an amazing surgeon and an amazing educator. So he's edited a video of his lateral oropharyngectomy. So this is taking out a T2 left oropharynx tumour, and you can see that here. So first, making the incision over the pterygomandibular raphe and opening it up there. The superior margin I often find it's often an easy place to kind of delineate. I will then kind of come across you're going to come over the actual palate and separate it from the uvula. You can take off a little nub, nub in there. From your lateral aspect, you want to basically chase that down and find your median raphe as you come down. And as you find the pterygomandibular raphe, you'll open up this blade. You want to make sure the tonsil and its tissue is kept medial, and you want to open lateral to it. Yeah, because you're not doing a tonsillectomy, you're doing an oropharyngectomy. So you take out the tonsil and you want some surrounding tissue. Then as you open up this plate, you'll see the plate of glossus, the plate of pharyngeus, hopefully the style of pharyngeus. You may see the medial pterygoid as you open it up as you come down. But all this stuff kind of rolls downwards and opens up. So as you can see some bipolar cautery, some monopolar opening. You get this dissection in this lateral plane. You can see the vessels there. The great thing about the robot is actually you can zoom right in and you can see everything as it kind of goes and you can just cauterize it and, it and it's wonderful. That's the plane that you can see opening up. This is coming down lower. We put a suction tubing in through the nose to allow to suck out any extra smoke. So you get some smoke evacuation issues and you can see the dissection of the plane that's being done there and the bipolar cautery. And then coming down towards the bottom, they're going to continue down. They're going to take a little cuff of tongue base in a minute just to give us a bit more space. As you can see, we're coming across. And there you can see the glossopharyngeal nerve lying right over the pharyngeus. And then you take this and often I'll take a little bit of tongue base tissue just to give myself a little bit more kind of access there overall. Dissect down through that plane. And then overall onto the posterior pharyngeal wall. This I often uh, flip around to the other side and I often make my cut on the other side so I decide where I'm going to go to and then I just join up and then you're you're basically completing your cut through there. Now you need to make sure that you this posterior margin you know where do you want to cut it off. Like I say I always take a little plane um, there because I find it helps orientate things with the pathologist and it makes their life generally a bit easier. The hardest thing when you start a robotics program is getting the head of the pathologist around the actual specimens that you're taking out um, because these always shrivel up. So you can see here, that's the posterior pharyngeal wall being cut. So I'll often do that cut slightly earlier just so I know where I'm going to end up. And then you roll everything out. Then when you're rolling it out, I often bring the camera back. You reorientate it exactly how you yeah. found it. And then we pin it on a cork board ourselves is normally what we do as a whole. Sometimes if you're worried about volator platal insufficiency as an issue, you can stitch your um, palate back to your posterior pharyngeal wall. This is what's called a V-lock suture, which is a suture which is auto locking and it's got little tiny barbs on it. And so we'll use these occasionally and we'll often knot them through. Um, and this often helps stopping the initial VPI that patients um, get sometimes after this. Most of the time they're fine as long as you don't take away more than 50% of one side of the palate. The, the risk of VPI is actually fairly low, but that is their big thing that they can get. So that is an oropharynx. So 
the oropharyngectomy in regards to a lateral oropharyngectomy for tonsil tumors i find as a set piece in, in my head and you just kind of change it around from that the next thing is is the um examination and assessment of the unknown primary so if you get a lateralizing neck tumor say on the left hand side you then need to play a game of where is the tumor well in our unit what we tend to do is do an mri scan if the mri scan is obviously positive then we'll do an eua and biopsy and confirm this if the mri is negative we'll arrange for a pet scan and then we'll use that as our guide if we have a true unknown primary in that sense, then what we'll often do is do a tongue-based mucosectomy and a unilateral tonsillectomy, all normally in one sitting, which is what we're going to go for in a second. Okay, to the next slide. So this is using a slightly different robotic system, which I'll talk to you about in a second. But this is a tongue-based mucosectomy and the workup for the unknown primary. So they're going to take out the tonsil. This is using a slightly different robot. It's something called the Medtronic Flex, which is a company which has actually uh, gone bust, which was specifically designed from a uh, head and neck point of view. But here they're doing a robotic um, tonsillectomy, so they're just taking out the tonsil. They're going to scoop that out. And so the Flex is just another type of robotic device that you can use. Now here you can take out the tonsil, keep all that mucosa intact, and you can clear the mucosa of basically the back of the tongue all out in a single unit. Here you can see these kind of cuts across. The way I, the way I kind of think about this is I often think of it like a, a book that's open. So I'm making basically cuts across the uh, base of the book, across to the other side, and then I'll often delineate in the middle. And I'll often use this as um, the middle part of the book. And that's often where I'll cut down and so you can see the resection that happens as a consequence of that. And I suspect there's just some tonsillar cysts there, more than an actual tumour, but they just look like little cysts. And you can see here, you're delineating it off the epiglottis and denuding the epiglottis. And you can see that epiglottis kind of whitey yellow bit coming out. So there's your tongue based mucosectomy happening on the left. You'll see an equivalent bit happening again on the right. So the way I kind of think about it is you make those cuts one side, you then mobilise laterally, you then roll everything down. I normally split the spine of the book, so to speak, then I roll everything down and I take that corner. The place that they're most likely going to be positive is where they're currently dissecting now. It's that corner of the tongue base going towards the back of the tongue. And so that's the place that most of these tumours actually end up hiding in. And here's the uh, tonsil coming out in unity as a single block unit there as a whole. And then you can see this, the style of glossus um, underneath you, which is just sticking there. You can see that all coming off in like a single unit as a whole. And there it's being dissected and moved around. Like I say, you know, there's always a couple of branches down here. Um, that you just got to be wary of, and you can use a combination of clips and bipolar here to just get control over it. So the dorsal lingual artery is not going to be a million miles away from it, and there's often some decent sized branches. Um, here's the left side coming off. So you can see that as a one piece. To then re take out your specimen, reorientate it, and relabel it up as you would do um, anyway. So we tend to use what are called clinic trays and pin those out on them. And then you'd repeat this on the other side and take out this tongue base on this side. I'm going to just skip a little bit of the video so you know. So this would basically come across here and take this out as a unit because it's basically the same on the other side. And that's roughly what it looks like. So one side taken all the way across. So that's an explorer exploratory tongue-based mucosectomy with a unilateral tonsillectomy. So what else can you use this for? Well, you can get down much lower down. So this is one of uh, Prof Christian's again. So he's taken out a sarcoma, which is sat in the peripharyngeal, hypopharyngeal space. So he's incising over it. I'm going to speed this one up because it's a fairly rare type of thing to do. You can dissect directly onto where the sarcoma is. Let me just come back to there. And he's dissecting this plane and opening it up. And you can see this sarcoma here where it's actually coming out. And then he's going to delineate it around the edge of it. 
and bring it out in Drawly in a second. And it's, this is just a slow dissection more so than anything else. And you can see here there's mobilization off from the top where it's taken off the pharynx. You want to keep it separate, obviously, from the great vessels, which aren't going to be right under the stylopharyngeus. And here it's coming down from the bottom and it'll all be delivered in a second. You can't get a four centimeter margin as you should do with sarcoma with minimally invasive surgery in this area, primarily due to the proximity of the carotid. Overall, you can see this tumor has been chased way down to the hyperpharynx there. It's just coming across some small feeding blood vessels. I'll just go back a second. So this is the tumor being pulled up and separated off. And it's been delivered so you can see the actual size of it. It's pretty impressive um, size of something to whip out. And that's the hyperpharynx tumor. Again, this is a, just a V-lock stitch like you had before. So the auto locking stitch and you can see the barbs on it there. So each one of those catches you pull through. And it always is a bit fiddly to stitch this up. And this is just to close up that hyperpharynx defect there as a whole. So you don't have a flappy bit of skin. Now, the next one's a video of mine. Unfortunately, I've not had a chance to edit it. So I'm going to be jumping around a little bit. Um, I've got loads of my own videos, but the problem is I haven't had time to um, crop them as prof has. Um, so this is a approach for an eagle syndrome. So I've just mapped out kind of the bullet points of where I'm going to mark for the eagle syndrome. So you open the pterygo mandibular raphe. You can see here is the mandible. Here you can see the anterior tonsil pillar. I often feel for that crease and just come, come straight down in that zone there. I open that pocket so the tonsil goes medially. I keep the tonsil in. I then just open up the plane, get into the parapharyngeal fat. I deal with the blood vessels with bipolar, just to keep the plane really, really, really very dry. And as I'm doing this, I want to open everything up because you don't want to be destructive because this isn't a cancer operation. And you'll see within about 16 minutes, we'll get down to the, the eagles and get it out. And you just want to be keep it really, really dry because you want that view to be really, really obvious. You can see down there, there's a big pumping blood, blood vessel looking right at you. Here we're coming down on it. Here's opening into that parapharyngeal space and opening that all up. You can see the raffi, you can see part of the pterygoid up there at the top. Here's dissection further down, opening that up and again, I'm just keeping that tonsil intact. And here is your first view of the eagle syndrome coming through. So you can see there's a random kind of white bit of tissue just there. So let's just get a bit of bipolar cautery to this. And as I open that up, there you're going to see this white bit of hard tissue just come up out of nowhere. Let's just jump a little bit. There we are. There it is. And you can see it delineating straight away. And you can see the, um, the style of hyoid muscle and ligament basically um sorry ligament not muscle um there as it's actually calcified and you can see the actual tip of it and then what you do is you mobilize this and you chase it upwards remembering that your carotid artery is only going to be three millimeters lateral to you there at that point in time so it's just making sure you're in the right zone and so what i'm going to do in a second is just get it a bit drier because it always does bleed a little bit around here you've just got to be a bit meticulous with it by the time we get to here, you can see just continue dissecting that a bit of a wash to get it out. A quick change of the camera. 
like I say, there's always blood vessels here. So there are always branches of the carotid directly. And then you can see the actual ligament right there. And that's what I'm cutting directly down onto. And you can see the mobilization above it. And you can see every time you let go, the tissue wants to flop back. So you mobilize this and you can see that entire ligament. Now, the thing about this is that, and you, you can see kind of how sharp it is and where it's sitting. Once you've got to this stage, yeah, the the problem is you can't actually cut across it because it's so hard and bony. So what actually ends up happening is you delineate it up to the top until you're happy with how high you want to go up with it. Once you get up to the top of it, you then basically take out the robot and then you use a rongeurs and you basically cut straight across it because it's basically like a hard bone and then you just take it out as a singular piece. And unfortunately, yeah, that's here being mobilized there and you can see it there with the rongeurs being cracked basically. So that's going to bite through. And there's the first crunch to mobilize it. And there's always blood. Yeah, because there's loads of blood vessels here. Yeah, so you just got to be really, really careful with it. So we're going to whip that out. I'm not sure if I actually pop it back in. Till the end. Apologies. But you come across that with the bronchures, so you clip that at that point in time, you then basically wash everything out, make sure you get hemostasis, then you close that again with the V-Lock suture as a whole. And I hope that all makes sense. I'm going to finish up there as a whole. Um, and I just wanted to say some thank yous to uh, both James O'Hara and the team in Newcastle for my first fellowship, and then Professor Sir Krishnan and the rest of the consultants from Royal Adelaide Hospital. Um, and Stephen Thomas, who helped set up our robotics program locally. Um, I will open everything up to questions in just a second. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thank you, Wendy. Uh, the first question is about the if the uh, robotic is not available because it's uh, busy mm -hmm. uh, and you have a. Uh, the do you consider doing this with um, like directly vision with the monobola and bivola. Yeah, so we look, we're lucky. So that realistic, that never happens with us is the honest answer. Yeah, and I think it completely depends on your skill set. So, for instance, if you work in Liverpool, Liverpool predominantly do laser surgery. So the majority of their work is done with laser surgery. Um, mm. So. Uh, like I say, the robot is not the be-all and end-all of it. It's just a tool. It's a knife, a fork, a spoon. It's whatever you want a class of the three, and you just choose it. So as long as you've got an appropriate tool in an appropriate patient, and it's not going to cause any deleterious effects, you can use whatever you want, is, is the honest answer. Uh, I've seen uh, Professor Jones, Terry Jones in Liverpool. I was discovered this, but I, it, like a few few times that there is no register with him, so I went with him in the theatre. I found that he... Uh, Ligated the um, external carotid artery um, usually few few days or, or le like a one less before uh, or sometimes in the same time and then go with the laser just like okay um, an hour finish everything um, get sub mucus uh, dissection um, or mucosectomy tongue based mucosectomy and tonsillectomy with the laser uh, directly one shot the same thing right left and then. Take it for uh, obviously. So that's it. Prof uh, Terry Jones is a genius with the laser, and yeah. he he makes it look easy. And that's the thing, you know, for us, you know, we've got the longest running laser practice, and we've got you know Sean Mortimer who's very laser trained. But it's it's funny because you know I'm very much robotics trained, so I can do laser and I do laser larynx, but I just I just don't do them because I just use the robot. Uh, so it's one of those funny things. So the other thing that you mentioned was arterial ligation. So I think back then when you were up there, um, which will have been best part of a decade ago, um, it, it was normal to ligate the external carotid as a whole, whereas now we go for selective ar uh, arterial ligation. So there's no evidence for or against one, but just people tend to go in, find the vessels, you find the carotid, you then chase up and then you chase up through three branches. So the ascending pharyngeal, the lingual, the lingual facial trunk, or the facial, whichever way it comes out. 
And um, so that's what people have moved to. That's what Liverpool have moved to as well now. And so that's the fairly I, to, standard. Be, to be honest, I, one of my professors back home used the Monopoly as what's the question uh, have been asked. And he used he was amazing dissector uh, with the Monopoly for tongue based tumors and anti oropharyngeal tumors. At that stage, it was like no robotics and the laser. We use the laser as well, but or the old laser is the micro manipulators are very difficult, by the way. We use it only for larynx. It wasn't really that malleable to use it in the oral pharynx, you know. At that stage, it's 2003, so I'm a bit, I'm four, so I'm, I'm a bit old person. <laughs> so, but uh, at that stage, yeah, you, you, they used to use the monoboiler, for sure. Yeah, and, and, and it's funny because exactly what you're kind of saying is that's what was kind of accepted a norm of just getting a headline and monopolar and just going for it, whereas actually things have completely changed. Um, Nagaraj, I see your. Yeah, I can. That's what I was saying. Nagaraj is putting his hand up here. Hi, 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 Bindi. Uh, it's a very nice presentation, excellent. And uh, keep going, doing your uh, excellent work in uh, Derby. Uh, just I need a couple of questions. One is um, the first one is what is the referral pathway from peripheral unit? Because by the time that uh, the yearly cancer come to us, we do bilateral tonsillectomy, panendoscopy. That is the routine procedure for us to diagnose. And then we will refer to uh, MDT. So that's the first question. Second question, when you are expecting uh, any vascular or bleeding, do you do embolization? So these two questions I would like to. Yeah, yeah no. So the, the first question is, basically, if you're a peripheral unit, it just depends on where, where your referral basin is. So our opinion is if you've had somebody turn up with a neck lump and they've got SEC, I would just do the MRI scan and confirm that there's something or not on the MRI scan because at that point in time, they're going to need a PET. And then we will quite happily take a referral at that point in time. So you don't need to biopsy the throat. You don't need to do anything. Literally, all you need to do is get an ultrasound FNA, a neck scan and a chest scan, and refer them for a PET scan and send them to us. And we'll see them either when they've had their PET scan or just before they've had their PET scan to then chat to them in that type of uh, sense. So, um, but the the problem is, is if you don't have, um, we're, we're lucky, we're like, we're, we're unusual, yeah? Most um, ENT units in the country don't get access every week. The only places that I'm aware of that get robotics access every week are us, guys, Newcastle and the Marsden. Yeah, most other units get um, operative access to the robot every fortnight or once a month. So if you look at Coventry, they get once a month. I think Leicester uh, now, they started the programme last month. You know, they get every other week. So, you know, this is fairly normal to not have it. So the, the, the delays that you come about are your access to robotics. But because we have such good access, we don't really have delays because you know, the most you're waiting a week, two weeks because we'll, we make space, if that makes sense. Um, in regards to embolization, we don't uh, routinely uh, embolize them actually at all because they're going to get a neck dissection anyway. Um, and we don't do stage neck dissection. We just try and do it all in one sitting. Occasionally, we will do a stage neck dissection two or three days before or two or three days after. Um, but we tend to just do it one sitting and just kind of get on with it. Um, and it saves a lot of problems if you have torrential bleeding and you basically secure their airway then and they're still bleeding then yes that is the group to go and embolize if you have bleeding as a post-op complication 100 um, percent but electively we don't uh, embolize them um i see a question from mo uh, morsi um if the robot's not available for whatever reason uh, all available slots already booked in uh can the surgery be done with the same concept of the monopolar and the assistant holding scope? So yeah, so that 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 is exactly what we're saying that you can potentially, and it is simply a tool, but it's it's just depending on what what you can do, what you can deliver, what stays safe in your hands. Things there's loads of people in the country all over who could always help and always happy um, to kind of go for it if that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. No worries. Any other questions? <laughs> so, uh, Mo, that, that's yep. really amazing, Bendy. Thank you. Uh, oh, I, um, um, there's a, just a question from Mo again from Sheffield. Um, 
Mo, you're asking about uh, uh, deep tongue based barks in the first case of cancer unknown probably than mucosectomy. So you might want to just stick your mic on because I'm just going to ask you about this. So if you look at your evidence base and you look at uh, the head and neck consensus day, which was carried out by the Royal College of Surgeons, ENT UK and Prof Polari from the Marsden up in Newcastle, not this November, but the November before. So November 2022. And I'm one of the people who uh, helped write the guidance on it um, because there were about 70 people there who, in effect, helped write the guidance by answering loads of questions at the consensus day. Um, that data from that very clearly states that you shouldn't be doing random biopsies of the tongue base for a cancer unknown primary your workup should be let me just i'll see if i can get you an image um very simply um working them up like i was saying with an mri scan plus minus a pet and then if not a deep biopsy isn't your preferential choice yeah um because you potentially open yourself up to lots of problems and the thing is these tumors can be like two three millimeters in size they don't necessarily have to be big in any way shape or form and that's what catches people out that they they can be so 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 small um and that that's why they can be um difficult and hard to catch out um, i will just see if i can get you Um, a quick image of my cheat sheet for exactly this. Um, are there any other questions while we're waiting while I'm trying to just scour my laptop for something? That's going to annoy me because uh, I can't actually find it for once. No, so, sorry, I, I, um, I've I got a protocol, but I just can't find it at this point in time. So like I say, the protocol we generally go for is MRI them. If there's not the MRI, pet them. If not, do a diagnostic mucosectomy plus minus tonsil, basically. Um, so yeah, the, the answer Mo is I'm, I'm kind of against just doing random biopsies. And the consensus guidelines uh, are a bit anti that as well, if that makes sense. Aha, uh -huh. I say that and I've just found it. Let me show you. So this is kind of my cheat sheet of looking at an unknown primary. So if you've got an unknown primary, you've got a neck lump on examination. Yeah. If your primary is obviously identified on CT and biopsy, then why waste resources biopsy the node? If you've got a lump, but no primary, i.e. a true unknown primary, then do your CT MRI scan. If your imaging is positive, then just biopsy it. If it's negative, then do the PET. Yeah, if the PET's positive, then do your biopsy. If it's neg negative, just make sure you do a skin survey so you don't mean it's cutaneous. And then do a tongue-based mucosectomy plus minus tonsil. Yeah, then that's normally the way I kind of work them up. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um... Thanks everyone for the attendance. Uh, please just do not forget to put your email so we can send you the certificate of attendance. And thank you, Bindi, for all of your efforts, to be honest. And uh, keep in touch. Yeah. And have awesome. a nice uh, evening. No worries. And uh, if you've got any questions, I'm happy for you to contact me. Yeah, sure.